What if there were one rule, one rule that you could live by, it was the only rule that you ever needed. If there's just one rule, and you could keep that rule, you'd be set. It'd be nice, it'd be convenient, it'd be great. We almost have that rule. I don't want to simplify it that much because you can't really condense the entire Bible down into a single rule and just say, oh, here it is. But Jesus Christ actually makes a statement that kind of does that. Let's turn over to Matthew 7. Matthew 7 and verse 12. Now this is toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And he's given a, a whole long explanation of of various things, mostly the commandments and, and principles, and, and really expounded and given a deep and deeper understanding. And he starts to essentially conclude this set of teaching in verse 12. And he says, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Some people have termed this the golden rule because of its value, because it it essentially is this, is, this is the way that Jesus Christ boiled down the law and the prophets. He, he took the, essentially condensed the Old Testament down into the single principle of whatever you want men to do to you, do also for them. There are many such variants of this principle uh, in many cultures and, and over time. Most of them, though, don't put it in the positive. Most of them put it in, in a, some sort of explanation such as, don't do evil to anyone that you wouldn't don't want done to you. They put it in some sort of you know, slightly different context. This explanation though, this expounding of, of this, this principle, Jesus Christ Really, there's, there's a whole lot in here, and we're going to dig into this today. But he says, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. He says, if you could boil the whole thing down to one set of here's what you should do, of here's how you should act, here's how you should live your life, he says, here it is. This is, this is how you can boil it down. Now, obviously, we can't say, well, it's just that simple. Just all you have to do, you forget about the rest of the Bible and just go do to others what you would want done to you and that's the whole deal. We can't, we can't go to that extreme and, and, and crop out the whole Bible and uh, some, some are prone to do. But we can, if we're looking to distill it down to its core, to something that, that we can say, okay, this is where we're going to start and this is what we can expound upon and this is really going to get into all the meat of of everything that, that God was trying to teach through the Old Testament. And as we'll see, a big part of what he's trying to teach through the New Testament, you can boil it down to this, this single concept of, in all things, whatever you desire that men should do to you, do even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Let's jump right in. Let's, let's really dig in and break this thing down, because there's a lot more here to it than what perhaps we just skim on the surface. Because it's one of these things that we know. Everybody knows this. You know the golden rule. Everybody says, what's the golden rule? Oh, do to others as you'd have them do unto you. Okay, great. Got it. You can rattle it off. But it's, it's almost deceptively simple in terms of what it implies and what it, what it really means and what it should really cause us to do and what it should trigger. So we're going to dig into that. He says, therefore, all things. Starts off by referring to all things. He doesn't, he doesn't put any limits on that, and he doesn't constrain that. He just says all things. It's everything. It's a quantitative statement that says everything. Everything that you could do, whatever you could do, all things. 
anything that you could do that impacts somebody else is sort of the implication because what follows is about how you treat other people. Right? It's, it's about how, how you affect other people. But it's very hard in this world to do anything, and I would argue impossible to do anything in this world that doesn't impact other people. What you do impacts other people. Even if you decide to go isolate yourself and live on a mountaintop somewhere, there's probably someone who cares about you who is going to be affected by that. And the rest of your life, you think that you're living out your life in isolation doing nothing that's going to impact anybody else. And in reality, there are people who miss you and there are people who would like you to not isolate yourself and would like you to be there. So really, you can't do anything that's not going to have impact on other people. That's not going to be impactful. God made us as social creatures. Right? We interact. That's what we do. And, and, and we need that as people. And so he says in everything, in everything that you do, in everything that impacts other people, because everything you do will impact other people. And then he proceeds to make a statement. He says, in all things, in everything, even in your relationship with God, in all things that you do in your relationship with God. And we'll get into that a little later, but it's a very inclusive statement. Right? He says, in all things, whatever you desire, that's how, it's, that's how the next little statement there is phrased in the modern King James, says, therefore, in the New King James, it just reads, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Uh, but the, 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 the Greek there actually says essentially therefore all things therefore everything everything whatever you desire that men should do to you do even so to them so whatever you desire so in all things whatever you want whatever it is that you want whatever it is that you desire is how it is how it's rendered but desire isn't quite the con doesn't have quite the connotation that the real intent of, of the statement implies. Because we think of desire as something that we want, whatever it is that we want, right? So whatever it is that you want people to do to you, that's what you should do to them. Well, it's not quite what you want people to do to you. It's because that really leaves it up to sort of you know, individual preference. What do I want people to do to me? You know, what, what do I really like? Maybe I like being punched in the face. So that's what I'm going to do to other people, right? It's not about what you want, right? Maybe I want everybody to give me all of their money. So I should go give all of my money to everybody else. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's not saying, well, this is, this is what you want. Everything that you want personally, selfishly, this is everything that you desire is not the implication. Desire here is, can also be, and is in many places also translated, determine, prefer, be inclined toward doing, or expect. The Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary says this. It says, it's not, of course, what in our wayward, capricious, gasping moods we should wish that men would do to us, that we are to hold ourselves bound to do to them, but only what in the exercise of an impartial judgment and putting ourselves in their place, we consider it reasonable that they should do to us that we are to do to them. Read that last part again. Only what, it's only what in the exercise of an impartial judgment and putting ourselves in their place, we consider it reasonable that they should do to us that we are to do to them. So here's what it's not. It's not acting in hope of some sort of reciprocal action. Right? This, isn't, this isn't doing something that you want done to you because you're hoping that everybody else will do that back to you. That's, that's selfish action. That's just 
pure selfishness, right? If I give everyone nice things, then they will give me nice things, and I will have nice things. That's not the intent of, of what's being said here. It's not about, oh, I, I, how, how am I gonna how am I gonna line this up so that I'll get people to do good things for me? I'll do good things for them, and they'll do good things back. It's not if I, you know, if I if I do something for somebody else, if I go out of my way and I I do this nice thing for someone, well, maybe they'll reciprocate and they'll do something good for me because I know they've got something that I want, and maybe they'll think that they could give that to me, and this will work out great. So I'm gonna go ahead and do something nice that they'll do something nice back. Not that at all. Right? It's not about doing something so that people will fulfill your selfish desires. It's not doing, doing things to get. Now it's also, as I said, it's not simply discerning a course of action based on what we want. Adam Clark, in his commentary, he, uh, he quotes another author regarding a scenario between a judge and a prisoner. Right? The prisoner has been, in his society, he's been tried and found guilty of stealing and he's been sentenced to hang. Now the prisoner can turn this around and, on the judge and say, if you were in my shoes, would you want to be hanged for this? And the judge, of course, will say, no, I would not want to be hanged. The prisoner can say, well, go and do what you would want done to you. Right? That's not really what it is, because it's not about what you want. You don't want those things done to you. You know, if you, if you do something horribly wrong, you don't want to be punished. Nobody, it, it's, so, so in that sense, it's not about what you want. It's about what you expect. It's about what you determine to be fitting. Adam Clark says it, sums it up this way. He says, guided by justice and mercy, do unto all men as you would have them do to you, were your circumstances and theirs reversed. So if you are the prisoner and you're talking to the judge, you can tell the judge, well, you would not want to be hanged if you were in my shoes. But the judge can turn this around and say, look, if our circumstances were reversed, and I were in your shoes, I would expect punishment for breaking the law. That's the, that's the treatment that I would expect. If you are, if you are discerning to that point and you understand justice and mercy, you would expect that you would be treated in a certain way. You wouldn't want to be treated in that way, but you would expect that that is what is right and appropriate. In the, in, the, in the circumstance there where it's a judge and a prisoner, the prisoner understands that he is committed to abiding by a certain set of laws. He's agreed to live in a certain country, they have a certain set of laws, and he has agreed to abide by those laws. So if he violates that law, his expectation should be punishment for that law. So turning this around then, it's not about whether you want to be punished or not, it's about whether you expect that or not. So determine here, or expect, is probably the better translation. Right? Whatever you determine that men ought to do to you, and this, of course, plays into both your sense of justice and your sense of mercy. If you determine that this is a just course of action, but you also are able to discern that this person is repentant, has regretted some sort of action, that should appeal to your sense of mercy and you should be able to say, now look, were I in their shoes, I might acknowledge that I had committed some offense, that I had done something wrong, but also if I were repentant, if I understood that I had done something wrong, if I were truly sorry about that, I should expect mercy. And then you, being on the other side of that, that coin, could then go ahead and show whatever it is that needed to be shown, whether it's justice, mercy, a combination of these things. But so it's not, it's not whatever you desire, it's not whatever you want men to do to you, it's whatever you expect, it's whatever you determine is most appropriate. 
Now, the interesting thing about that is that Jesus is essentially making an appeal to your sense of judgment, your personal sense of judgment. He's saying, you ultimately must act based on what you understand. It leaves a little bit of room for error because none of our senses of judgment are perfect. None of us can, can judge and have perfect understanding over what should be done appropriately in any situation. Right? And we, we are left to make these decisions personally, individually. Hopefully with the help of God's spirit and hopefully with his understanding and his wisdom really guiding that and really helping us in our discernment. But he is making an appeal to our ability to judge. He's saying, here's how, here's how you should live. You're going to have to use your personal sense of judgment, led by God to the best of your ability, to make decisions about how to treat other people. You're going to have to make a decision based on what you would expect done to you. And again, that appeals to, uh, that, that requires a certain level of judgment on your part. Clearly, your understanding is probably inadequate, but it's adequate enough that Jesus Christ is comfortable telling us that this is the tool that we should be using. He says, your discernment, your ability to, to judge what should be done to you in any given situation is the tool that you should use to determine how to treat somebody else. You know, at some level, you know how you ought to be treated. All of us are very good at that. We're very good at, at being able to assert how we should have been treated. Right? We know when we've been wronged, and we know how we should be treated for that to be made right. And we always want to stand up and assert that. You know when you've made a mistake on the flip side. Uh, and you know when to expect punishment. Again, you also know when to perhaps expect or hope for mercy based on your attitude. Mercy is really one of those things that we have to be more hopeful for and less expectant of. But if you are repentant, then you would probably expect a certain amount of mercy. It's these expectations of how we ought to be treated personally that are usually reliable as a guide for how we should treat other people. So it's, it's these things. It, it's, it's interesting because Jesus Christ has, has really set this up so that we have to make decisions based on what will inherently be a flawed uh, set of judgments, right? Because it's, it's you making a judgment, a personal judgment, right? You're using God's spirit. You're led by his spirit. You have the wisdom that God has given you in whatever measure. But there's going to be some room for error in there. And yet, even so, Jesus Christ said, this is the, this is the tool. This is how you're going to make decisions about how to treat others is based on what you personally understand to be the way that you ought to be treated in a situation. So it requires a certain amount of discernment. It requires a certain amount of wisdom and understanding. And obviously, to make these decisions well, it requires God's spirit and his involvement in your life. You must also carefully consider somebody else's situation. So you have to make a judgment based on your personal understanding, but you also have to make a consideration of, of how you're going to interact with this person. What, what's their situation? What, what factors are in play here that should maybe allow you to be a little more merciful than just? Are there things going on when you're interacting with somebody in, in, in whatever situation, again, in all things, in how you're going to interact with someone? Are there things that maybe you should say, you know, this person really has this factor and this thing and this other thing going on right now, and, and that's got to be very hard for them. So because of that, I'll either not be so exacting in the demands I place on them or 
I need to be merciful and helpful with this person, or oh, this person could really use a little bit of help or encouragement or whatever it is that this person might need. You have to carefully consider that situation. You also have to carefully consider whether there's some sort of error there that if it was met with some sort of justice on your side, wouldn't cause some growth for them spiritually. If you're going to interact with somebody and you recognize that there's a problem, that there's an error, but that you could act in a certain way toward that person that would help them to grow spiritually, if that involves some sort of correction, or if that involves some sort of guidance somehow, uh, as unpleasant as it may be, that's probably the right way to go. That's going to help them with spiritual growth. So again, it's all these things you've got to consider and you've got to really balance justice and mercy, usually a mix of both. But, but here, essentially, this, this section, whatever you desire, as it's rendered, implies that you must first, before action, make a determination about some course of action based on your expectations of how you should be treated. So you've got to sit there and figure out what it is how you should act. You've got, to care, you've got to consider it. How should you behave based on what you would expect from someone else? It's a consideration you need to make in order to properly interact with another. From there, he says, do even so to them. So therefore, all things, whatever you desire that men should do to you, do even so to them. So we move into this, this next set of principles here. Do even so to them. It's a very active concept, right? This is not, the, this is not put in the negative, right? Again, some of, them, some of these golden rule variants will be put in the negative. Don't do anything to anybody else that would harm them, essentially. Don't do something to somebody that you wouldn't want done to you, right? And in that sort of mindset, you can say, well, I just won't do anything to anybody else. And I fulfilled the rule. Right? This, is, this is the opposite. This is an active, it's a very proactive rule. It says do. Whatever it is that you would want people or expect people to do to you, you need to do. You need to actively go out and do. It's not a thought, it's not a feeling, it's not a disposition. Here's how I feel about this person, okay, and I've covered it. No, it's, it's about action. It's about how you interact with these people, what you're going to do in your interactions with other people because you're going to act one way or another. Again, your actions are going to impact people. So it's more about taking your actions and making sure that actions are targeted with specific purposes. Making sure that what you're doing is being done thoughtfully and right in a, in, in a right context and a right mindset. Action is often where we hang up. It's often where we sort of stall and we just, okay, well, we intended all the right things and we felt the right way towards someone and we thought about how we should interact with them and we know what we should do, but it's going to be kind of rough if I actually confront them on this, or if I try to get involved with this person's life, that's gonna, wow, that's really a big commitment. I don't think I'm gonna do it. You know, it's, it's easy for us to really just sort of stall out. We just hang up. It's like, okay, this is, this is what should be done. This is what would be good and right. right. We have all of these people who are not feeling well, who are sick, uh, and, and we need to be praying for them, and we need to be, Encouraging them, you know, the, the cards, the phone calls, the visits, these things are encouraging and good, right? So we can know, all right, we can consider and say, well, you know, I bet this would be really encouraging to this person. I bet this person could really use prayers. Uh, I bet this person would really like a card. I should do that. You should. And then very often, we just don't, right? Life is busy. We have a lot of things going on. I do, you do. You know, we have a lot of things happening. 
and we can feel all the right ways and discern the right things and understand what we should be doing and know what we need to do. And until you follow through in action, until you actually follow through and do it, you haven't fulfilled the command. You haven't fulfilled the rule. You've just thought about it, right? So until we actually act and we do something, it's, it's just not enough. Let's turn over to Matthew 25. Matthew 25 and verse 45. Jesus Christ is talking about judging the nations at his return. Well, at the, at the final judgment. In verse 45, he he will answer them, some of these people that came and, and say to him, look, we, we did all these things in your name. And he will answer them saying, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. You weren't active. What didn't you do? Let's go back to verse 42. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. He says, here's all these things that you knew you needed to do, perhaps. You could have gone so far as to discern and say, oh, look, I know this person could really use this. This person really could use this. This is what's right and good and appropriate to do in this situation. I need to go do that. And simply failing to do that he, here at the, at the very end, says, inasmuch as you did not do it, right? You didn't do it to one of the least, and therefore you didn't do it to me. It's kind of a big, impactful statement. Because it's not so much that these people were out being evil or being bad. It's simply that they neglected to do. They just neglected to act. That's all it is. They failed to act and do what what was appropriate. They failed to go out and do even so to others, right? Failing has, it has its consequences. Failing to act has serious consequences. The, uh, the word it in here in Matthew uh, 25, 45, doesn't actually appear in the text. So it, it, it would actually read this way. Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do to one of the least of these, you did not do to me. You did not act. Inasmuch as you did not act toward one of the least of these, you did not act toward me. It's the same, it's actually the same word over in Matthew 12. It says, do even so to them. Do even so to others. It's the same, same active verb, right? It says, do, go, act. So we need to be active. We need to be action-oriented. Sometimes this means that we have to stop playing nice. Sometimes action, we fail to act in the things that are good, right? We fail to send the card or say the prayer or, or whatever it is that we need to do for others. But sometimes there are things that we would like done to us or for us that we would expect as appropriate things for other people to do to us and for us that we don't do toward them or for them. Now the simple example of this and the lighthearted example, let's say you're at a big meal with your friends and you have a giant piece of salad stuck right, right here, right smack in the front of your teeth and it's a big dark green piece of spinach and you are laughing and everybody's having a good time and you have no idea that that's sitting right there in the front of your face. Now, the expectation, my expectation and my hope, if I'm ever in that situation with any of you, is that one of you would hopefully lean over and say, Scott, you've got a giant piece of spinach right here in front of your teeth. You should get that out of there because you look really ridiculous. Right? That's the expectation. You would expect, you would hope that the appropriate action is that somebody would point it out, and preferably that they wouldn't go, hey, everybody, look at him. 
He's got a big piece of spinach in his teeth. Right? You would hope and expect that it would be done discreetly. That it would be, you know, it's, hey, by the way, get that out of your teeth. Oh, thank you. Right? It's done quietly. It's done sort of on the side. It's simple, right? But sometimes we fail to act in that scenario because we don't want to embarrass the person. It's strange, right? We don't want to embarrass the person, so we're going to let them keep being embarrassed. Um, because it can be a little bit sort of awkward to say to somebody, hey, you've got something stuck in your teeth, or hey, your fly is down, or hey, you're, you know, it, that, that can be a little awkward, and so sometimes we fail to act. We just fail to do, right? So we need to just stop being nice and friendly for a second and say, hey, you've got something in your teeth. You should get that out of there. Oh, okay, thank you. Right? Usually, though, it's not quite so lighthearted and simple. Usually it's something bigger and something more, uh, you know, just that thing that you know you need to do that's just going to sit and churn and churn. You know you need to talk to somebody or you need to do something, and this would really be the appropriate thing to do. I, if I were in this situation, I really hope that somebody would do this for me, and I really need to do that, and I'll do it tomorrow, you know? I'll make that call tomorrow. Example, let's say you started a new job and you began spending an inordinate amount of time with your coworkers or whatever the situation is, right? You, let's say you start spending an inordinate amount of time with someone who is not a part of God's church, right? And you're really sinking a lot of time in with, with whoever this other person is so much so that your spiritual life is just taking a back seat. And what's worse is that you aren't even aware of it. Now I hope hearing that scenario you would say, wow, I really hope that somebody would say something to me. I hope somebody would mention something to me. I think we've all probably been in those scenarios before where something has taken precedence over our spiritual life, over where we should be, over what we should be focused on, and we haven't been aware of it. If you've been in that situation and you've had somebody come to you and say, hey, just so you know, I noticed that what you were doing is really, you know, I, I haven't seen you at church as much, or I noticed that you're kind of lax about Friday nights, or I noticed that you you know, whatever it is, right? If you've had somebody come to you and say, I, I, think you, I think you might need to sort of take things a little more seriously here. You have probably done two things. You have probably uh, reacted horribly toward that person who said that to you. And secondly, you probably realized at some point that they were right and you've turned things around and you're still sitting here today. So it's, it's a difficult situation. That's one of those hard things where action becomes hard. You don't want to act because it means confrontation. It means a situation where you are going to have to go right into it with somebody and address a situation that is unpleasant, that is probably maybe going to distance you from that person for a while. And it's not going to be a good thing to do. But, again, let's, let's go back and sort of live by this standard. If you were in that person's shoes and you were starting to go down that road, wouldn't you hope and expect that somebody might come to you and say something? And if the answer is yes, then it's probably a good course of action to take. Now, again, with discernment. Right? Should somebody point out that, that problem? Should somebody point out that spiritual weakness? Probably, yes. Should it be you? Maybe. If you're close enough to that person to do that, yes. If you are not close enough to that person, and how we define that is, is very subjective, if you are not close enough to that person, you may be able to do things to encourage it, to encourage some sort of change. You may be able to 
uh, steer them sort of from afar. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's hard to, you can't just jump into a stranger's life most times and say, hey, by the way, I know you hardly know me, but uh, I've noticed that you're really doing some dumb things over here and uh, you should really not do that. I'll say, I don't know you. Why are you talking to me like this? But if you have the kind of relationship with a person where you can do that effectively, as difficult as it may be, it's probably your place to go do it. Because, again, are you going to leave that to somebody who doesn't know them as well? Are you going to leave that to a stranger f to, for them to point out? Are you going to just let them slip away? Right? It's, it's our responsibility to, to hop in and do these things. And then again, considering, considering what you would expect done to you, how would you expect that to play out? Would you expect that to be a, you know, would you like it if somebody was going to correct you in one of these situations to s sort of pull you into a room and sit you down and tell you, tell you how it is. Look, here's how it is. Here's what you are doing and you are one of the just, you know, densest people I've ever seen. I can't believe that you're doing this. You should change. How effective is that going to be? For some of us, maybe it's very effective, I don't know. Um, for most people, that's not going to be effective, right? It, if it's something done out of love, out of concern, where somebody says, look, I've noticed, I've noticed that you've been a little bit, you know, different with things since you've begun this thing or that thing or whatever it is. You know, I have concerns about you. I really want to, you know, really want to make sure that you're still with us. I really want to make sure that you're still a part of God's kingdom is what it comes down to. Right? I really want to see you in God's kingdom. I really want you to be there and therefore I'm going to breach the subject with you because I think this is something that will steer you off of that track. Right? We have to be careful with how we approach people in some of these things. But again, we have to act. We have to do. Right? We have to be active and we have to be doing. I'll just mention in passing Hebrews 5.14 where it talks about strong meat belonging to those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. These are people who are in the habit. Reason of use there means in the habit. They're in a habit of, of action. They're in a habit of doing. They're in a habit of discerning. They're discerning things and they are active to the point that they know, they know how to discern good and evil. They know how to act on that. They know how to interact with people. Sometimes, sometimes these decisions, right, these golden rule type decisions, I got to do unto others as they've done unto me, or as I, sorry, I want to do unto others as I would expect that others would do unto me, right? Sometimes those decisions have to be made very quick. It's a very snap decision. You're in a situation, something happens to you, you need to be able to react in a way that is good and appropriate, that follows this principle. But if you're not in the habit of discerning properly, and you're not in the habit of acting properly and doing, you're probably going to fail in that situation. Because you haven't been discerning, you haven't had your senses exercised by reason of use. So, again, you, you must act. That's the point here. You must act. You have to do. This isn't a passive command. This isn't a, this isn't a hey, just first do no harm kind of principle. This is a go and do kind of principle. All right, continuing then, back in Matthew 7. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. So he gives us the why. He says, this is why. Here's what you should do. Here's how you should do it. Here's who you should do it to. The when and the where are situational. But here's what should happen. Here's how it should happen. And here's why it should happen. This is the law and the prophets. Discerning the proper treatment of others and following through in action fulfills the law and the prophets. Fulfills the whole thing, which is pretty incredible when you think about what's in the law and the prophets. You think, 
what's in there? Well, everything. Uh, commandments, okay, I understand commandments. That'll, you know, this, this fulfills the commandments. Something like prophecy. How does this, fu this fulfills prophecy? Essentially, yes. Prophecy is given, right, as, as an encouragement, as an exhortation, so that we can grow spiritually, so that we can come to maturity, so that as mature people, we can live and follow this principle that we can follow and keep all of God's commandments, that we can love and care for others and treat them in a way that God would treat us so that we can be a part of that family one day. Right? All of these things are given so that we fulfill the law and the prophets, so that we fulfill the intent of God giving us this, this whole book. Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, because Matthew 7, 12 is sort of toward the end, Earlier, in Matthew 5, 17, he says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but fulfill. So in the beginning, he's making it very clear. I am not doing away with anything here. I am filling it to the full. He tells us he's come to, he's come to fill, fill to the full what the law and the prophets are and what their intent is. And now here at the end, as he's sort of beginning to wrap up his teaching, before he gives some final encouragement, he says, this is the law and the prophets. We're going to summarize it. This is the law and the prophets. And, he, and he, he just expounds on it. It's not don't murder, don't steal, don't kill. Those things are there. And he's, again, he expounds on those. And says, here's the full intent of those things. But now here at the end of the teaching, he says, look, here's the full intent of the law and the prophets. Here's what you need to do to fulfill the commandment. You need to treat others lovingly the way that you would expect to be treated. And, and this fulfills, fills to the full the intent of the law and the prophets. Now it's interesting because over in Matthew 22, he makes a similar statement. So let's turn over there. Matthew 22. Matthew 22 and verse 37. He's been asked, which is the great commandment in the law? And he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now it's interesting because he gives us a different summary of the law and the prophets. He says everything, everything in the law and the prophets hangs on these two principles. And back in Matthew 7, he says the law and the prophets can be fulfilled and summarized in this one statement. So he sort of gives us these two uh, related summaries of what the law and the prophets are, what the law and the prophets do. What can we deduce then from this? We have two principles expounded here in Matthew 22. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. Let's, let's start with the second one here in Matthew 22. Uh, verse 39, right, he says, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now if we think back to Matthew 7 and verse 12, it says, do unto others, right? Whatever you would have men do to you, do to them. And here he says, love your neighbor as yourself, which he's quoting from Leviticus 19. He's quoting from the Old Testament, saying, saying this is what's going to summarize it here. Um, this do unto others, then, equates with love. If love your neighbor as yourself can be fulfilled in this, this statement, do unto others. Matthew 7 verse 12 gives us a practical definition of what love looks like, of what love is. Matthew 7 is in practical terms, the guiding principle of love. It's action, right? It's not, it's not feeling, it's not sentiment, it's not simply knowing. It's 
acting. He's saying this right here, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, that's love. That's what love is and that's what love looks like. It's not so much about how you feel, it's not so much about how you just think. It's about how you act, it's about what you do toward others. So he gives us in Matthew 7 that guiding principle, right? It's, it's the thing that fulfills the law and the prophets in the same way that these two commandments uh, define them. So this is, your, this is your primary mechanism then for determining your course of action in life, in all things, right? In everything, right? Treating others as you would want to be treated, that's your, that's your primary, this is the primary tool in your box for determining how to, how to act, how to behave, right? Both proactively and reactively. Whether it's proactive, we have a bunch of teens that are getting ready to go to camp, right? Every year, we collectively as a people get ready to go to the feast. We have individual activities that we prepare for and that we can gear up for and that we know we're, we're leading up to. Proactively, we plan for those activities and should be personally planning for those activities based on the principle of what's going to be good for other people from the expectation that I have of how I would be treated. Right? How, how am I gearing up for, how am I planning for these things? What am I, I'm, I'm getting ready to go do this thing. Now, where should my mind be? What should I be planning for uh, proactively this week, this day, this month, this year, as I get ready for this activity? Right? How you plan that is gonna be defined by this principle, by this, this rule, right? It's gonna be defined by Here's how I should treat other people, based on my expectation of treatment. It is reactively your primary mechanism for interacting with people. And we do these things. So we plan proactively to go do something, and then we get there. We get to the feast. We get to camp. We get to go see family. We get to do whatever it is that we get to do, and things happen. And things don't always happen that are so great. So reactively, how should we interact with, with those things? In the spur of the moment, how should we react? How should we behave? What's, what's the thing, what's that, what's that touchstone that's gonna come back to you in that, in that quick instant that's going to guide how you react to whatever is being done to you? Is it what's being done to you or is it what should be done to the person on the other side of the table? It's, it's, really that simple in a, in a sense. And it's really pretty brilliant that we have this one principle that we can really use as this, this mechanism, this tool for making decisions. We have this one thing for making decisions that you can just fall back to in an instant and say, look, how would I expect to be treated here? This is how I'm gonna act and go, right? Because these things define love. They define love toward neighbor, love toward God. Our treatment of others is really an expression of love. Now, if you've been in Phoenix East for a while, you may be able to sit there and wonder, why do we keep harping on this love business? Why do we hear sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon about love? These guys won't stop about love. Let's look at a few scriptures. Romans 13. This is just sort of a sidebar, but I think it's important to point out. Romans 13 and verse 9. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, so again, we see here, Paul summarizes this and says, all right, so the commandments are summed up by this thing, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, that's a good reinforcing point. Let's turn over to Galatians 5. Galatians 5 and verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
Okay. All right. Good. So, again, the law is fulfilled in this principle, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's why we can equate it back to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Because in the same way, we, have the, we actually have the exact same terminology used here. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, right? This is the law and the prophets. Jesus came to fulfill, and here he gives this summary, this explanation, this full explanation. It says, you shall treat other people the way that you would expect to be treated, right? You should love your neighbor as yourself. Paul here in Galatians says, all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Over in 1 Timothy 1, in verse 5. First Timothy 1 and verse 5. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. The purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart. Again, here's, here's the purpose. Here's, here's how we're going to summarize all the law and the prophets. Here's how we're going to summarize everything that we have been instructed by God. Love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. So again, it's, it's, it's an important point. It's one we have been driving home a lot lately, I think. But it's, it's a very important, very critical point that love your neighbor as yourself, treat others the way that you expect to be treated, it is really a defining principle and it's really at the core of everything that this book boils down to. It is about love toward neighbor, love toward God. Let's go back to Matthew 22 and... and uh, revisit the first part of that. That's those great commandments. Uh, Matthew 22, verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So we just covered the second great commandment. The first great commandment here, we're told is, is right there at the core of all the law and the prophets. Over in Galatians 5, as we read, all the law is fulfilled in one word, love your neighbor as yourself. We're to treat others the way that we are expected to be treated. All those things we tend to, to steer toward are interactions with each other, with man. And the word in, in Matthew 7 there when he says, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Men is definitely men. It's, it's anthropos, right? An anthropologists just study people. Anthropos are people, right? So the scripture there is, is definitely stating you do, you act toward man, but there's a case, there's a case to, to, to make the point that Matthew 7, doing unto others is also how we interact with God. It's how we interact with the Father. Both statements in Matthew 7 and Matthew 22 are summary statements of the law and the prophets. They're both, they're both there as summary statements. Over in Galatians 5, it's a summary statement of the law and the prophets. Right? Here's these great principles. In Matthew 7, he says, In all things, in everything that you do, in all that you do, would seem to be very inclusive, right? Inclusive of your relationship with God. Inclusive of how you act towards your God. So the case here in Matthew 7 is not explicit, but I think you can extend the concept here to say, this is how you interact with God also. He has shown us what a father should be to his children. Right? He's shown us what a father ought to do to his children, for his children. And we all can acknowledge that and know that he's done so much more than we can really even fathom, or that you would ever, ever really expect. But he's demonstrated, here's what a father does for his children. So from that standpoint, we can say, all right, so what 
ought these children to do for their father, to their father, right? What's, if, let's turn the tables, right? If you were a part of the God family and had done all of this for humanity, right? Had, had done all of this creating and done all of this sacrifice and given up life and given up your son, what, what would be the expectation, right? What should be done to the being that does that? If you want to turn that back around, if you want to apply the golden rule here to your relationship with God the Father, right? What should be done in that situation? What ought you to do? And from there we have everything that, that we do, essentially. God gives us a whole set of commandments and says, do these things, these are how you are to interact with me. But if you're, if you're applying this principle, you're going to say, well, here's, here's what I ought to do toward God. Right? We tithe, as an example, because God gave to us. He, he gives us everything. We give him a tenth of what we have. Right? But as a child of that father, that feels pretty appropriate. Right? It's something we ought to do, and therefore, we do it. We pray because God first communicated with us. He first contacted us. He first reached out to us. He gives us his Bible. He's, he opened it to us before we ever could have interaction with him. Right? And he opens that word to us and says, here, here's my word. Communicates with us in that sense. So then as his children, we can say, oh, you know, well, here's how I ought to treat the father that has done that for me. I should be talking with him. I should have a relationship with him. I should communicate with him. These are the things I ought to do as a child. We follow his commandments. We follow his way of living because he first demonstrated them to us and toward us. And so we can say, wow, well, he's shown us this, this amazing set of principles and this amazing way to live. He actually came down and, and lived it for us and showed it to us actively, said, here's how to live. Now, as children of a father who has done that for us, we want to do that, right? If you've ever been a parent, you've had kids and you've said, look, if you love me, do what I tell you to do, right? If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, do, do what I want you to do because I've got your best interest in mind. Right? Then as a child, looking at this relationship, we should say, well, what I ought to do, what a child ought to do toward a father in that, in that situation is do what he told me to do. Keep his commandments, follow his way, live his way of life. Right? We, and, and even in that, we are emulating our elder brother. We're simply saying, I'm, I'm going to follow what you said I should do. Ultimately, we give him our lives because he first gave his life, he gave his son for us. He gave us his spirit, part of his life. I mean, he gave us physical life, right? So essentially we turn around and say, okay, as children of the God, of the father that did that, we ought to, really the expectation is that we should take this life, take all that he's given us, and essentially devote it toward whatever, whatever it is that he wants us to be doing in this life. Right? Whatever his will is for us in this life, right? which is ultimately to be a part of his family. Right? So we can take this principle, we can take this idea of doing unto others and apply it toward our Father, and apply it toward here's how, here's how we should act, here's how we should interact with our Father because of all that He has done for us. Here's what we ought to do. Here's the expectation. Let's turn over to uh, Mark 12. Mark 12 and verse 34. Well, let's go back a little bit. Mark 12:28. One of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked Jesus Christ, which is the first commandment of all? And here Jesus Christ outlines the two great commandments. 
as we just read. Right? Love God, love neighbor. There is no other commandment greater than these, he says in verse 31. So the scribe said to him, well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth, for there is one God and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart and all the understanding and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the, the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom. He said he was close. He didn't say, you are in the kingdom. He said, all right, you're correct. If you can fulfill all of these things, if you, can, if you can do these things, if you can uphold these great commandments, if you can treat others the way that you expect to be treated, right? if you live your life by that principle, you are not far from the kingdom. He says, you're close, but you're not quite there. Right? He says, essentially, fulfilling the law is not the same as entering the kingdom of God. Right? It's something that you will do if you are going to be a part of God's kingdom. But simply doing that, fulfilling the law, right? everyone under the old covenant, if they had been able to fulfill the law, would have fulfilled the law and the prophets, and there was no promise of eternal life under that covenant. Right? It's not something that they were they were given. They weren't given entrance to the kingdom of God simply because they fulfilled their obligations under the old covenant. Right? It was part of it, and it's a very big part of it. And don't get me wrong, it's not an optional part of it for us. It's not something that we can say, well, I don't need to, I don't need to follow this principle of, of uh, treating others the way that I need to be treated. I don't need to keep the commandments. I don't need those things because those are old covenant things. No, Jesus Christ came and fulfilled and expounded and said more even than that, right? You have to, well, let's turn over there. John 13. John 13 and verse 34 Another favorite, a new commandment I give to you, and you can probably rattle it off. New commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. He takes it even a step further. He says, okay, here's the principle that will fulfill all the law and the prophets. And you have to have a mastery of that, but here... Here he takes it one step further and says, look, you have to love each other as I have loved you. And this is something that nobody, again, and we've, we've made this point before, but nobody had ever seen it demonstrated this way. Nobody had ever seen God's love demonstrated towards somebody else on this planet in the way that Jesus Christ demonstrated it. So he comes and he says, as I have loved you, that's how you're to go love, right? And he fulfilled the law. He, he did all of these things, right? He, he had a mastery of doing unto others as you would expect to be done to. He had a mastery of that. And we have to emulate that, and we have to do that. But we have to love as Jesus Christ loved Right? We have to, this is, this is not a replacement of that principle. This is an extension of that principle. This is taking that golden rule even one step further and saying, here's what Jesus Christ did. Here's how Jesus Christ would love. Okay, then that's how I need to love. This, this here is not something that can be fulfilled without God's spirit. Right? The golden rule can essentially, theoretically, sort of, be fulfilled without God's spirit. You can do unto others as you would expect to be done to. And a lot of really good people do that. And they live good lives, and they treat others in a way that they would expect to be treated. And they, they fulfill that principle, and they do an excellent job of fulfilling that principle. 
that's good. They are probably blessed for it, and they probably enjoy a lot of happiness in life for doing that. But you can't fulfill John 13, 34. You can't have this love that Jesus Christ had without his spirit in you. Right? And that has a whole set of prerequisites. You have to be baptized. You have to have repented. You have to have ongoing repentance. Right? You have to have a relationship with God. There's a whole set of prereqs for that, that that we know of and that we are aware of. But you must, you must have those things. You have to have God's spirit in order to love the way that he loved. Right? It requires a mastery of doing unto others. But just that mastery alone, just having that one principle and fulfilling that one principle alone, again, will fulfill the law and the prophets, but it is, it is not sufficient. There's, there is more. You have to love as Jesus Christ loved, right? And that's an extension of the principle that requires everything leading up to it, requires everything that we've talked about today, requires obedience to his law it requires following his law living his law the way that he lived and it requires loving the way that he loved which requires his spirit and it's when you have a mastery of that type of love that you are ready to be a part of God's family and that's where we want to be so in all things whatever you determine not only that you would have done to you, but whatever you determine that Jesus Christ would do toward you, that Jesus Christ would do, do even so to others.